Welcome to the panel discussion on internet for financial services over 5G network and use cases of securing 5G enabled financial network. We have with us Ms. Mili Kwa. Mili is a global thought leader in, in 5G and payments and a business strategy expert. She's an experienced corporate strategist having supported CEOs on high priority strategic initiatives at Frost and Sullivan, she's a part of a global network of mobile and wireless researchers that cover telecoms and payments. Prior to joining Frost and Sullivan, Mealy worked with and within leading tele telecommunication network operators in Asia Pacific and has also worked with a market leader payment system operator in Malaysia. She has faced corporate decision makers over 13 years in the past, and she brings with her considerable knowledge and experience in corporate strategy and planning, strategic business development, as well as planning and successful execution of new services, technology, and regulations. Welcome, Ms. Kwa, to the panel. We have with us Dr. Reshmi Pia. Dr. Reshmi is a scientist in Society for Electronic Transactions and Security, SETS, under Office of Principal Scientific, Principal Scientific Advisor to the Government of India. She has worked at HPL Infosystems as a network engineer in the beginning of her career. There she was involved in many major network projects such as phase one of the Tamil Nadu statewide area network, Alcatel voice over IP integration and etc. She is a Cisco certified academic instructor and has con conducted many value added training programs, programs for Cisco certifications. She is a recipient of Anna Centenary Research Fellowship for three years from 2011 to 2013. She is an active researcher and member of Information Security Operations Center, IPv6 Forum, and many technical associations. Her talk on cyber security vulnerability, threats, and attacks during the inauguration of Center for Excellence in Cybersecurity by IETE was well appreciated by all national and international cyber specialists. She is an editor and reviewer for many reputed journals and has contributed more than 20 research articles in reputed journals and books. Her research focuses on security of wireless and next generation networks. Welcome Dr. Reshmi to the panel. We have with us Mr. Prashant Chug. Prashant is currently working as a group leader in CDOT, Center for Development of Telematics, New Delhi. In his career spanning nearly 25 years, Prashant has worked on research and development of multiple telecommunication products. He is currently working in the area of post quantum cryptography and has recently initiated a study in TSDSI, Telecom Standards Development Society of India, on post quantum cryptography in 5G network. Prashant and his team in CDOT are developing next generation data encryption product that shall offer quantum security in the data networks of future. Prashant is a senior member of Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineer, IEEE, and is currently chair of IEEE Communication Society, Delhi chapter. Besides post quantum cryptography, he is also interested in privacy preserving deep learning applications in finance and healthcare sector. Welcome, Mr. Prashant, to the panel. Thank you, Mr. We have with us Dr. Abhishek Thakur. Dr. Thakur has a career spanning more than 20 years, split across industry and academia. He has executed multiple global projects for both product and services based organizations. For the last couple of years, he is with IDRBT, where he works on open source technologies and fintech collaborations. Besides offering consultancy to banks, he is investigator in projects on distributed ledger technologies and 5G use cases lab for banking and financial sector. Besides banking and financial domain and data center technologies, his research interests include multimedia communication, financial inclusion, and other rural focused information and communication technologies. Welcome, Dr. Thakur, to the panel, and, and over to you.
Dr. Abhishek, I think you are on mute. Could you kindly uh, unmute yourself? Sorry, sorry. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, so quickly getting into the uh, opening remarks. When we are looking at those cases for securing 5G enabled financial networks, and I'm including the ambit of 5G and beyond, because what we are doing today is 5G is gradually moving to 5G as well. Is the network not just compute but make towards services as well beyond 5g networks we are talking of the system itself embracing the verticals early implementations are talking of depending on who we are talking of at IDRBT we are looking more from perspective the other trend that we are looking at has a security implication is the modularity. I'm getting a lot of echo. Uh, can I request others to be on mute? Thank you. Okay, looks like we have a challenge here. So the modular nature that looking at some of the implementations of 5G and beyond systems, uh, where the whole supply chain is sort of getting disaggregated and the software aggregates it together, brings its own set of challenges with respect to security. So as we discuss further, we would delve a little bit more on it. Few open questions, and these are the questions for us to ponder, but not necessarily in the same sequence as we go through the interaction. Do we foresee verticals converge with the financial systems and other verticals? on a beyond 5G network in a manner that we seamlessly enable each other. What does it mean? Today, accounting and other pure from telecom. But can it now be the verticals, not just billing and accounting, payments and other financial services as well? So that is where we get to what are the roles for financial services in 5G and beyond. How much of it is coming from the network? How much is added services? How are we having this plugged into the architecture in a modular manner? And finally, we see security play out in this context because we are talking of a lot of flexibility. We are talking of a lot of innovation, a lot of modularity. Are we getting a bit too complex from security perspective? Again, I'm not making any statements here. These are the thoughts I wanted to seed through before we move to the panel discussion. My first question I would be addressing to Mili. Mili, as a practitioner in the domain, what are the key global trends that you are seeing with respect to 5G enabled network and financial services? And while we are doing it from India, we would like to see the world perspective that you see. Okay. Uh, thank you for your question. So maybe let's start. Um... My thoughts are that uh, over the past few years, uh, there have been an overall decline in number of uh, bank branches and ATMs. Uh, also, with increasing globalization, markets uh, that were very local focus, um, like Japan, have uh, seen to open up and provide global paper method acceptance, not only on the retail payments front, uh, whether online or offline. ATMs accepting foreign payment methods are on the rise in Japan. These changes have triggered, uh, have triggered 5G concepts that look at real-time analytics on the banking floor to drive sales and customer experience and potentially uh, realignment and redistribution of resources nationwide to increase financial inclusion tap on underbank uh, population of the, the countries and down costs. The first point um, have traditionally not been good at harvesting the massive amount of data um, that they sit on. Um, in, in this respect, 5G will offer the capabilities to process large amounts of data in real time and produce actionable insights that can directly impact the top and bottom line. For example, if banks knew the gender of the customers waiting in banking hall, they could play a suitable advertisement to perhaps increase investment participation among men and uh, financial inclusion among women. The second point, banks can replace branches with uh, more distributed ATMs, more online support, 
including through mobile that can replace the traditional time-consuming trip to the back in home. If you are lucky, it could be a 30 minutes drive with no traffic during lockdown. But for some, it could be a day traveling. With 5G routine tasks, uh, such as transaction authorization and processing, ID verification as part of KYC for customer onboarding um, and loan tracking, and especially tasks lacking volume um, can be offered nationwide, supported from a central location with minimal resources or 5G ready infrastructure. As we yet launch in all countries around the world, the practicality of these 5G concepts remains in question. Or some may argue that uh, there are already 5G smartphones in the most remote places of the world. Use of 5G will require scalable use uh, cases to succeed, and to date, I have not seen too many. Great. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Neely, for this honest critique on how 5G is really being seen. Many of these things are enabled on 4G, and redeployment of resources looks very interesting uh, as an overall value proposition. Thanks. Prashant, my next question is to you, and this is more with respect to the discussion we had where we are having multiple uh, elements in the 5G and beyond networks and financial services coming together. Uh, given the increased security challenges, and uh, you are an expert in quantum computer realm, do you foresee increased usage of machine to machine or API based communication for financial services in 5G and beyond networks? What are the emerging trends you are seeing? Prashantji, you have to unmute. Yeah, am I audible? Yes. Yeah. Uh, thanks, for, thanks, Abhishek. So I see a uh, lot of machine to machine uh, transactions are happening in the network for automation. But from the security perspective, uh, there's a catch there that a uh, lot of uh, IoT devices um, are resource constrained and uh, updating them, patching them with newer security threats becomes a challenge. And uh, with respect to post-quantum cryptography and the quantum threads which are coming basically, so a lot of new algorithms are being studied and uh, all the end devices need to be patched with the newer algorithms. So, so that way, uh, whatever uh, res uh, resource constraint devices are there, they are uh, patching them with the newer algorithm, newer threads can become a challenge. So on one hand, uh, having uh, uh, IoT and machine to machine for various uh, purposes like uh, automation, etc., is useful. And on the other hand, uh, there is a security element to it. So, all these machines uh, uh, have to be have a, a good amount of uh, computation power and memory so that uh, they can be uh, the software, etc., can be easily patched and updates can be applied from time to time. Otherwise, uh, in my opinion, uh, they are, uh, they can have, they are a potential threat because they are adding a lot, uh, the threat vector area is expanding a lot because of these. So it's a fine balance between the two. Uh, thanks Prashantji for uh, emphasizing on the challenge we face there. Uh, Reshmi, uh, in Indian context, we see multiple analysis more from banking's perspective. I'm reaching out on this question. We are still using RF links. We are still using uh, geosynchronous satellite communication frequently at below one Mbps speeds. So, even though the world has moved on to 5G, we are, at India we are still rolling it out. Uh, there may be a significant gap for 5G to be ubiquitously deployed. What it means is 5G networks would rely a lot of places to augment themselves to other heterogeneous connectivity options. How do you see this impacting security? Uh, very good afternoon. Thank you, Abhishek, for posting the question. So, uh, yes, we see 5G to be heterogeneous in these uh, initial stages. And uh, as like these would be existing for some time until there would be a complete transition to a 5G. So there are like even micro payments happening with uh, different interfaces. And uh, because of this, there are like many service providers which are coming up with uh, 
new solutions which would be adapting to the customer to give new experience and they use different authentication protocols so they may be compatible and may not be compatible completely so in this case there is a security concern which need to be addressed at this level and uh, we have seen like a secondary authentication algorithms are even being used by the financial service providers to make sure this happens without any flaw from their side but with respect to the compatibility issues, yes, we have problems in this heterogeneous features. Uh, but probably there are some researches going on in like blockchain-based financial networks where they try to have a transparent uh, cross-border payments, which would be adapting to the retailer and the customer uh, transaction experience in a secure way. So probably these would be the most foreseen uh, future of 5G uh, services with respect to the financial uh, services and other than that we can see uh, not like uh, 4G, 5G transitions there would be many physical interfaces which would be helping out in uh, financial transaction even through a, a smartwatch or, uh, or a headset anything can be a future so this would be an expected uh, security concern that would be uh, addressed very soon if there is a uniformity coming up so this would be my uh, answer for your question. Thank you. Uh, Amelia, I'll circle back to you. Uh, how are you seeing the financial services enabling other verticals when we are talking of 5G and beyond networks? So far, we were just looking at sort of 5G and financial services coming on. But if you think of other verticals, how do you foresee financial services playing out in the next few years, maybe? Okay, so uh, in APAC, we have like 4.3 billion people, 56% uh, are internet users, and due to COVID-19, internet traffic is on the rise. So with little gap between the waves that we had over the past year, um, there is high chance of new behaviors uh, shaping the future. To confirm this, we did a survey last year uh, to understand if people felt that change is here to stay. So not surprisingly, we found that 75% of consumers in APAC said that they will continue using contactless payments after the pandemic is over. Uh, safety and cleanliness cited as the main drivers. So because we now prefer cashless, some um, changes have taken place around us. The most obvious change for us as consumers lies in retail. Since the lockdown, there are more refurbished um, restaurants, more contactless menus, more delivery services, We've gone online now more than ever before to shop for what we need. It is the case that retail cannot happen without payments. The same can be said for true use and not aided use, autonomous vehicles in the transport industry and robots in the healthcare industry. Um, the availability of 5G in the region will no doubt expedite the pace of digital transformation of industry verticals. However, uh, I feel that there's still work to understand uh, end user needs, partner fit, and the go-to-market plan for an effective implementation within enterprises. Based on our survey last year, only 67% of companies understand the full impact of 5G on their industry. We'd like that to be 100%, but it's 67% for now. The need to scale payment system capabilities will become strategic imperatives as cash usage declines. If paired with payments, 5G can revolutionize the way consumers interact and the way enterprises compete. It will trigger a sea of change within the industry ecosystem. Do the COVID-19 expedite 5G or the 5G enable the support necessary to COVID, uh, support with COVID? I think when COVID benefits some articles, if we do it right, 5G and payments can benefit all verticals. So I think 5G was already going to change the world. COVID-19 just showed the world a few things that 5G can do to address need. Great. Yeah, I think the timing-wise, we didn't see the Tokyo Olympics the way we wanted, but yes, COVID has accelerated some of these things as well. So the commonality there, uh, since you mentioned about uh, the Tokyo Olympics, uh, it is a trigger that you were looking for to um, unleash <laughs> cashless volumes. We are all looking to the Olympics because the Olympics has been a trigger in many instances. Um, 
in other uh, locations for uh, cashless to uh, increase in adoption. Since that didn't happen, uh, COVID was the trigger in this case. Looking at with financial services in 5G and beyond networks. And this is that you are foreseeing. Dr. Arushik, my connection was lost in your recommendation. Hello. So, Prashanji, my question was, what are the key improvements you foresee in realm of security for financial services in 5G and beyond? Looks like Prashanji is having some. Am I audible, uh, Vishik? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so you were mentioning about. Uh, I understand. Uh, I think my connection was broken. So I think you are uh, mentioning about the newer uh, challenges uh, in the 5G financial security. So, if I have uh, understood the question correctly, so uh, uh, since my area is actually I'm working in the area of uh, post quantum cryptography, so there I see that uh, the advancements in the quantum computers uh, is actually a, a potential threat to the cryptography in all the sensitive areas. So, now finance is a very sensitive area, and uh, in the 5G. Uh, also, we see that uh, if you if you see the 3GPP architecture of 5G, so there are lots of places uh, where the conventional cryptography is being used, and that is uh, uh, subject to uh, attack from the quantum computers. And all all the experts are saying that this asymmetric cryptography is uh, going to be completely broken in a few years, and there uh, uh, th there is going to be a lot of problem in this key distribution and all. And uh, I see uh, that is a very uh, grave threat coming. Uh, uh, see the advancements, seeing the advancements which are uh, happening in the quantum computer and quantum algorithms. I see grave threat to the uh, sectors, uh, especially financial sectors, where we see uh, we are seeing that 5G is going to be the most uh, important basic pillars to be used. So there. Uh, lots of uh, efforts need to be done, but uh, yes, the solutions are also emerging out. That is on the positive side. So a lot of work is happening in the area of post quantum cryptography and uh, quantum queue distribution, and uh, also the combination of the two. So I feel that uh, in the coming years, uh, uh, we will have uh, our networks. Uh, being uh, recognized uh, with the uh, quantum secure solutions and uh, that will be the ideal for uh, having all the sensitive transactions going on in the network otherwise uh, the users uh, will never have the confidence because uh, so many uh, you, you never know that uh, there may be so many uh, uh, projects going on on uh, quantum computers and breaking on the existing algorithms and you, the users need an assurance there actually. So uh, PQC and QKD combined together definitely uh, have to be the pillars of the uh, 5G for financial security. That is my uh, take on it. Dr. Abhishek, are you on mute or uh, yeah. some issue? 
I'm repeating this multiple times. This is um, uh, not a good sign here. Yeah, <laughs> every time I go on mute, I forget to unmute. Uh, yeah, Reshmi, I'm having a follow up question with respect to say end devices and other things challenge for upgrades because of resource constraints and other things. So how do we foresee the endpoint and the mobile edge security evolving with respect to 5G and beyond? Uh, yes, we talk about the evolution of the devices that have come up with uh, 5G. We are seeing the devices are coming lightweight and have a, a feature of like uh, multiple interfaces where offloading is possible. So when we talk about the edge computing ca capabilities in 5G, yes, we are coming up with much more enhanced features, which would be helpful even when we uh, talk about the financial service usages. So this is how I see. And we see even from the endpoint perspective, there should be some feature which could be dynamic and ready to change according to the uh, challenges that we face with respect to the uh, like manageability, uh, supply chain, usability, cyber threat, anything. So there should be a dynamic and also ready to change feature that would be expected in the uh, end devices in the coming up like uh, future uh, 5G devices uh, that are right now in the development phases uh, and more than that there are like uh, much more complex uh, protocols and also like uh, frameworks which are coming up for the endpoints which can ensure more like uh, uh, automation uh, response and also like security orchest uh, orchestration these are the expected things at the edge at the endpoints over to you Abhishek. thanks thank you Thank you. Uh, Prashant, uh, next question I'm posing to you. I hope the network is good right now. With yeah. the raw 5G network, we are having more and more IoT devices, variables, coupled with third party services being offered, more in a plug and play multi vendor scenario. The proliferation of these IoT devices in 5G networks will be accelerating some automation. Uh, the enterprises offering these services also have additional security threats with respect to financial services and so forth. So how do you see this being addressed? Or do you yeah, see... I, yeah, actually I partly answered this in the earlier question where uh, I mentioned that uh, uh, IoT devices are good for uh, enterprise services and automation, but uh, most of the IoT devices are uh, resource constrained and uh, having them in the network and uh, it's introduces a new threat vector where uh, uh, since the updating of uh, these IoT devices and uh, patching them with the newer security solutions, newer uh, uh, algorithms becomes difficult. So there is a fine balance uh, which has been maintained. So if you can have the IoT devices for uh, the advantages which you are getting, but uh, it has to be ensured that uh, the IoT devices which are put in the network along with the, the other uh, uh, financial data where the, the network where the financial data is being transacted, those IoT devices uh, need to have uh, sufficient uh, resources in terms of processor and memory and should have a sufficient uh, uh, lifetime where it can be patched uh, over and uh, all the security vulnerabilities uh, which come from time to time they need to be patched otherwise when these IoT devices are uh, we are not able to uh, fix the security weaknesses their vulnerabilities there then uh, over the time they can become a very potential uh, threat to the rest of the network actually. Right. Right. Yeah. So the, just to tag along the response that Rashmi had on the last question and the take you are having with respect to threats, uh, beyond quantum key distribution, quantum cryptography, and mobile edge compute, uh, and the associated protocols to de-risk the network. Uh, do we see any other solutions? Do we foresee? Obviously, the best practices of patching and reading these things will continue. Uh, but uh, do we foresee some other trends emerging on technical fronts? Either of you can answer. Sorry? 
So, see, for example, we were looking at mobile edge compute and similar to the, the complex, uh, the next series of protocols and architectures being defined to ensure a better onboarding of heterogeneous devices and the fact that enterprise side is having challenges with respect to financial services. Uh, Prashanti had mentioned uh, quantum key distribution, quantum cryptography, and the best practices, quantum safe crypto, basically, and the best practices with respect to patching, upgrading. But we do know that current devices will have some additional risk. And that is where I see that edge compute could be possibly helping offset a bit. But OK, these three, four technologies we have talked about. Do we see some other trends also coming into play there? That's the question. You know, uh, when we talk about like the evolution of attacks, when we come up with a new solution, it's going to be a new attack. So as of now, with the uh, threats that we have seen, uh, till now, we see these tackling, other than like the misconfiguration or the security patches that we have left, there are some uh, endpoint security features that have come up with an evolution, uh, like anything with respect to uh, threats or anything with respect to the network threats. Yes, we have different solutions coming up. So uh, I believe uh, the evolution can only be uh, the right point to say, other than saying a specific point with which we can completely uh, come or, uh, over with all the like complete security anyway we have. <coughs> Thanks. Thank you. So we have a follow-up question to you. Uh, with uh, so many varied stakeholders, including the government or state, user, private security for private services provider over the top layers and so forth. And then this sensitive uh, data that we're typically dealing in financial services, uh, differential privacy becomes a key element uh, to enable in the next generation platforms. What are your thoughts on these uh, requirements? Now with the 5G, we have seen different financial services uh, providers, service providers coming into pictures and they are looking for better user or customer experience solutions. So when this comes in, there is actually a, a competition in between them to find out the best in among them. So for this, there is like a play which comes with like both data privacy and data analytics, analytics to be required at the same time. So in this case, there is a risk of privacy and there is a violation that happens. So in this case, differential privacy should come into picture, which is uh, very much required from the customer or the user point of view. So there should be a, a legal regulation that could be uh, formed in, to meet the legal requirements from both the stakeholder side and the customer side. So that would be the better way to approach it rather than uh, going for a research without any uh, specific limitations. So this is my point. And uh, yeah, yeah, Rishaj, uh, may I like to add something there? Sure. sure. Yeah, so with respect to uh, privacy, I think uh, financial uh, data privacy is very important. And a lot of upcoming techniques are uh, coming there to enhance the privacy. So these techniques collectively called privacy preserving techniques, they include uh, a combination of homomorphic encryption and federated learning and differential privacy as Dr. Reshmi pointed out. And then there is secure multi-party computation. Hmm. So these techniques are actually very important. And uh, we, we need to understand that uh, uh, when your financial data analytics is uh, happening in the cloud by some third party, then uh, uh, over the network, the data might be encrypted, but when it is uh, analytics is happening uh, at the receiving party by some third, third party service provider, then your privacy is at stake actually. So these techniques, a lot of research is happening and to combine these techniques and come out with uh, some solutions uh, where uh, the financial uh, privacy, which is very important, uh, is uh, assured. And when the user can get an assurance and user can get an assurance of his privacy, then definitely we like to use more of the networks, more of the financial services. And uh, so a lot of research and emphasis needs to happen on uh, these techniques and the combination thereof, actually. Yeah, just uh, one. Yeah, I just want to jump in um, on um, somewhere in between. <laughs> so, so I, I did see uh, come across uh, one vendor that uh, 
although was not using the solution directly for financial services, um, he um, showcased a solution that was not sending information, but sending uh, the answer uh, to the question uh, across to the cloud for further processing. So that kind of like uh, alleviates some of the traps or risks uh, with regards to sending sensitive uh, data, even though you're encrypting it end to end. Right, so what we're saying maybe is rather than the actual data it is sending. So there's uh, the, in this case is uh, uh, an advertising uh, platform that uh, telcos and uh, even financial providers can use to target. So uh, what it does is that there's, the, there's an application that integrates, interrogates a local application in the phone. Okay. Okay. Um, and then gets an answer, yes, no, and sends that yes, no back to the cloud for further processing. Okay. It's a series of questions that yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, and leads to the complete answer. Okay, fine. So, so the data actually moves rather than the backend, it's moving to the edge device, gets processed. Um, it, it was not moved, that's why I, I, I said it was in the in between. It, 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 stayed at it, not moved. it was there originally. So, when you look, download the app, right, you have to sign in some, um, no, sign up and you fill in some um, data. Um, that is normally uh, you hope would be secure. Um, this uh, application interrogates that local setting. Yes. Just answers. That's an interesting take of ensuring privacy. You mm. put the question. I thought it was quite. I thought it was quite interesting as well because it's a somewhere in between. It's not an edge. It's not a cloud. It's a yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Great. Interesting. Uh, yeah, and in fact, there are a lot of uh, similar needs that we will need in the financial uh, use cases, be it the regulator, be it uh, dispute management, be it settlements. Yeah, so we will have to have a lot of such solutions coming up. Okay, so uh, one question to you, Mealy, uh, because you touched on the answers coming from the device and building up into use, user experience for the your opening remarks. So as a financial services industry, when we have to ensure that security is never compromised, at the same time, we have to provide a frictionless user experience and more and more digital experiences. How do we balance the expectation of speed, privacy we have been discussing about, and the other risks that we may have? Yeah, uh, interesting that you, you asked this question because I happened to uh, be on multiple uh, panels last year and I had like people from all kinds of <laughs> organizations and businesses. Um, on one hand, I had like a really big players like Swift saying that you have to put in like four layers of security and make it really robust and secure. And then on the other hand, I, I heard from fintechs. So, hey, um, all we have to do is to maintain trust. So basically my take from, from um, all these uh, panel discussions that I had last year was that I think it's quite clear um, that customer experience is a key success factor. So many companies will work to cover as much of the risk factors as they can, but thereafter becomes a commercial decision. It's not the case of needing to put layers and layers of protection at all costs to prevent any incident. It is a case that of um, what you do when an incident happens and the trust that has been the basis of your customer relationship comes into question. Um, I, think, I think that was my basic takeaway from my panels. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a fine balance. I wouldn't say go all risky. I wouldn't say go all secure. I think it's what you need for your setting because uh, not all the um, applications, so like the banks uh, will be very different from what a fintech player would need and etc. Of course, this uh, should uh, not discount regulatory compliance and etc. Right, and just to add on to your point, because uh, uh, from Indian perspective, we are seeing a lot of rural implications coming into play where the digital literacy itself in India may not be there. So, as you were saying, right, it's not just about fintech or the bank or the regulator, it's also about the context where the customer is coming from. And increasingly, we are seeing step of authentication. Can some 
transactions in fact uh, some of our uh, authorization okay. having another layer added on okay i didn't quite get you for the last one minute <laughs> i don't think there was a question in there <laughs> no, no it's not a question i was just adding on to the observations yeah, okay. you made what I'm mentioning is yes as you rightly said it is the fintech or the bank or the regulator but it's also about the solution provider keeping the content user with respect to the experience is it a tech savvy person versus is it a, probably a rural person who is not digitally there yet so the, yeah the security implications the trust implications in the rural non digital savvy world starts to throw in its own set of challenges yeah, That's I, just I think, I think the, the, the commonality between the two settings that you mentioned uh, is also process. It's not about technology um, only or people only. It's also, it's also the process. And they go hand in hand. So technology, people, process, and uh, yeah, a decision. Right. So any thought panelists on this? Agreed, Mili. It, it's, it has to be augmented with the process of policy. Uh, Anand, is there any other question from the group? Yeah, we would have liked to take one or two questions, but uh, we ran out of time. So we'll have to uh, wrap it up. And uh, thanks to all the team speakers for sharing their thoughts and insights. IFG will definitely enable a plethora of industry applications, just like an open source platform like Android Grid. And thank you all for uh, being a part of the track session. And to the attendees, I'll say uh, do stay tuned in because we have an upcoming session on securing the bank of future. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, esteemed speakers. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.